Picture this, if you'll excuse that foreshadowing pun. You're at your local city mall in Ohio, a place that's never still. Every time you go there, no matter what time of day or day of the week, it's always full of people, all bustling about, shopping, eating, dashing past one another. Maybe, presumably like everyone else, you came in to get some specific item, or you might just be browsing. Heck, you could be there for a casual date, or to grab a bite to eat at the food court. That's when you remember you need to have your picture taken. It could be that your passport is about to expire, or your driver's license hasn't been updated since you moved. Whatever the reason, lucky for you, there's a photo booth right here in the mall. Take your own photo, boasts the sign on the outside of the cramped cubicle, a list of instructions below describing just how quick and easy the process is. You take a look at the price list, feed the right amount of money into the slot, and take a seat inside. Pulling the curtain closed, you straighten your back, look directly into the lens, a short countdown appears on the screen. Three, two, one. A flash bursts from the bulb above the lens, filling the booth, and leaving those white spots floating in your vision for a few moments. You head back out of the cubicle, waiting to pick up the glossy paper with your photos on it as it starts rapidly printing them off. You wanted a two by two, four total pictures of your face. But then, as it finishes printing and you inspect the pictures, turning the paper in your hands, you're met with a surprise, an unnerving one to say the least. The pictures don't show your face, in fact, it barely looks like a human face at all. It has your clothes and your hair, but the whole image has been warped. Not just out of focus, but completely disproportional. Annoyed that you spent your money only to receive a highly distorted image, you wander off to find another booth, throwing the unusable picture in the nearest trash can. Now, sure, you might write off something like that as just an odd occurrence, a freak of technology caused by faulty machinery in desperate need of repair. But what you don't know, in fact you won't even realize until it's too late, is what really just happened. When you sat down and that flash went off, taking your picture and printing it off as a warped, unrecognizable mess, something was born. Located at the end of a series of long, winding concrete stairs and kept out of sight behind doors marked Keep Out and Staff Only is a lower level of the mall. Hidden in this dark, off-limits area that no member of the public is permitted to access, there is a service door, somewhere in the southwest corner of the third sub-basement. Just taking a look at it, you could easily imagine nothing at all interesting behind it, like a power generator or a storage room. But if you were to push it open and venture inside, you'd stumble upon something you would never have expected in your wildest dreams, or more accurately, your most disturbing nightmares. Beyond that service door is a cavern, hardly the first thing you'd assume to be secreted away underneath a city shopping mall. Although if you're into cave jumping, it would be ill-advised to take a spelunking adventure down there. The entire cavern isn't actually part of our world. It's an extra-dimensional space. Think of it as its own little pocket universe that has somehow become connected to ours and can now be accessed through this doorway. If it helps, you can even picture our universe as a big soap bubble, with a slightly smaller bubble attached to it. In actuality, it's infinitely more complicated and looks nothing like two bubbles of different sizes, but like we said, if it helps to picture it that way, then go right ahead. If you were brave enough or naive enough to venture deeper into this cave and not to be put off by its walls that look like they've been carved from pure limestone, then you would have had to watch your step to avoid a nasty fall. Within the large cave space is a deep, dark pit, a rocky conduit in the ground seemingly leading down into the earth. But taking a closer look, the walls of this pit aren't made of rock. They don't even match the limestone that the rest of the cavernous room looks to be cut from. The surface of the pit is coated in a slimy substance, closer to something biological, coming from a living thing rather than being carved out of rock. Depending on your familiarity with the texture, you might even say this substance is not all that far off from the appearance and feel of human fat tissue. Although you probably shouldn't reach in to try and touch it for yourself, least of all because the walls of the pit are constantly secreting a corrosive substance like acid that could easily break down your body by its molecules, painfully burning you until you melted down into soup. But there's something else down there. Lots of somethings, as a matter of fact. 
And the moment you took that photo, sitting in the safety of the booth in the mall above, a new something found itself born into the pit. It looks almost exactly like you, but its face is all wrong. You could even say distorted, like a photograph that didn't quite come out right. The abnormalities in its face could take the form of lacerations, cuts and open wounds, or bloody welts, like looking in a mirror at a twisted, injured version of yourself. Or this imperfect copy might have growths bulging out from its head, covering its facial features to make it virtually unrecognizable as a clone of you. Then again, maybe it'll just come out missing everything. No eyes, mouth, nose, just a blank, expressionless mask on a body otherwise identical to yours. And what does this thing, this clone, do now that it finds itself in a pit, filled with other writhing, imperfect copies of everyone that's ever sat to have their picture taken in that photo booth? Well, what would you do? You would try to get out as quickly as possible. And that's what it will start doing. While you're going about the rest of your day, maybe stopping off at a few stores in the mall or complaining to the customer service staff about that faulty photo booth, it's already started climbing. Its fingernails are digging into that fleshy tissue that coats the walls of the pit as the copy drags its imperfect body upwards, crawling over the others around it that are trying to do the exact same. There's no telling just how many of them are down there, how many misshapen heads and deformed faces your clone has had to barge past and climb over as they all pile deep down within their hole in the ground. And what's the worst part of all this? It's not just the climb. The fact that your copy has to fight its way out of the pit, making the near impossible ascent to make it to the surface. No, the worst part is that you have no idea it's happening. You're completely oblivious that a distorted clone of you is raking its nails against walls of fat tissue, clambering up from underneath the ground. And even more so, you have no idea what it wants to do when it gets free and finds you. The SCP Foundation has long since been keeping an eye on the anomaly that they themselves have designated as SCP-715. Given that the photo booth itself was connected to the extra-dimensional space buried deep below the mall, Removing it isn't really an option. Sure, they could have easily have cordoned it off and put up signs saying the booth was out of order to deter members of the public from trying to use it, but this was the SCP Foundation after all. They needed to run tests, figure out exactly what this anomaly did, and how it ticked. Gerald Patton had been a rising star at the Foundation, a promising researcher who had long been proving his mettle since he first became part of the organization. For a time, the higher-ups at the Foundation had planned to attach the researcher to the SCP-2090 project, studying a basketball player who somehow gained anomalous powers. However, hearing about the photo booth in the Ohio City Mall, he turned down this request to instead join the team researching SCP-715. Certain high-level staff of the SCP Foundation noted this to be strange. Patton had never turned down a promotion before as the SCP-2090 project would have offered him better pay and more vacation time. In order to observe the photo booth closely without alerting the public to their presence, Foundation staff on site were disguised to blend in with civilians, and some posed as retail staff employed at the mall. Come closing time, once everyone else that worked there or who had been shopping throughout the day had finally left, the Foundation researchers were free to run their tests and investigate the anomalous photo booth. It was the night of a routine sweep. All staff members on site were required to test the surrounding area for reality warping anomalies. The sweep was mandatory for the entire team assigned to SCP-715, yet quite unusually, researcher Patton didn't report in for the procedure. The higher-ups at the Foundation decided to let this indiscretion slide, though. After all, there were a lot of personnel involved in the process, so Patton was let off the hook. In fact, the few disparities in Patton's behavior only became more apparent when Dr. Agatha Wrights began to more closely collate and process the files and information on the personnel on site. She was the research head on the SCP-715 project and quickly noticed a few things that didn't add up about researcher Gerald Patton. His rejection of the offer to join the SCP-2090 project and refusal to attend a routine reality-bending anomaly sweep might have seemed like unrelated incidents at first, but both would have brought the researcher into contact with technology that the Foundation used specifically to detect any distortions to reality. If he had taken the promotion or been present for the sweep, he too would have been within the scope of this specialized detection equipment. Yet both times, 
he managed to avoid being put in such a position. What the hell was Patton hiding? And what would show up if a detector was pointed at him? Dr. Reitz was growing ever more suspicious of researcher Patton and his behavior. However, it was when she learned he had secretly tested the photo booth himself that she decided to take matters into her own hands in order to get to the bottom of what Gerald was up to. She had to mull it over and think about things cautiously. She couldn't confront him directly, at least not yet. Even the evidence she already had, that Patton had seemingly twice avoided situations involving the use of reality distortion detection equipment wasn't enough to prove for certain he was hiding something. Both instances could have been caused by something completely unrelated. Gerald could have rejected his promotion purely because he was more interested in SCP-715 than joining the SCP-2090 project. And even Foundation personnel needed sick days or skipped work because of a hangover without telling anyone, which could explain why he was absent during the sweep of the mall. But Agatha wasn't convinced. It felt like the two instances lined up too closely. They felt far too similar to be an utterly random coincidence. Even if Gerald wasn't up to anything dangerous, the only way to know for sure was to observe him, but without drawing attention to it. He'd deny anything, act completely differently, maybe even flat out lie if he knew someone was listening or watching. Agatha was forced to think in a way that was as calculated as she was certain Gerald had been. His quarters were located in a secluded part of the sub-basement, a level above where the fleshy pit could be found. Almost all the Foundation personnel assigned to SCP-715 slept somewhere on site, their presence there masked from the ordinary mall employees. Taking care not to be detected, they had installed doors with a keycard system meaning only members of their own staff could access the living quarters under the mall. If any civilians happened to stumble upon the Foundation and discover them, then all it took was the careful application of amnestics to ensure that they wouldn't remember a thing. Beeping her keycard at the door, Agatha slipped into the living area. It mostly consisted of a narrow corridor with rows of doors on either side. Behind each one was a cramped room, each only big enough for one person, a bunk to sleep in, and a sink with a mirror above it. Gerald's room was the furthest from the entrance, right down at the end of the corridor, as far from everyone else as he could get. Although it also meant if he came back from testing early, then he'd be more likely to catch Agatha leaving his room and walking back along the row. It would be hard to come up with an excuse as to what she was doing anywhere near his quarters, especially as her room was right behind the very first door, right next to the entrance. All this was rushing through Dr. Wright's mind as she squeezed into Patton's room. In actual fact, the interior space of them was so limited that they were even smaller than most ship cabins. Her hand had been clasped around the handle of a metal case, which she sat down on Gerald's empty bed. Unclasping the clips that held it closed, Agatha opened up the case and took out what was held inside the inner layer of protective foam. It was the Fulman Breaker Anomalous Optical Enhancement Device a piece of the specialized apparatus that Foundation researchers use to record and identify any person or object that might be exhibiting anomalous properties. It utilized state-of-the-art optical enhancement technology and could be used to detect whether a subject was causing any distortion to the reality around it by accessing visual spectrums that were normally imperceivable to the naked human eye or sometimes even unobservable in this dimension. Agatha looked around the tiny cabin, given the limited space, she was also short on options as to where she could hide the device without it being easily noticed. It was also imperative that researcher Patton had no idea he was under observation. Dr. Wright looked over to the sink in the corner, the mirror just above it. Sure, it was a tactic taken straight out of the big book of spy novel cliches, but it would work. The advanced spectrum capabilities of the optical enhancement device would be able to record Patton through the glass. Luckily, the entire living quarters had been pretty hastily built, which meant it took little effort for Agatha to loosen the screws holding the mirror in place. But that's when she heard the distinctive beep of the door to the living quarters, followed by the gradual footsteps getting closer and closer. It might not have been Gerald, but there was also an equal chance that it could have been. Acting as fast as she could, Agatha placed the optical enhancement device on the wall and covered it with the mirror, frantically trying to screw it back into place as quick as she could. The echoing noise of someone approaching sounded as if they were almost right outside the cabin door by the time Dr. Wright had tightened the screws enough to keep the mirror in place. Giving a quick final scan of the room, making sure nothing looked too conspicuous, she grabbed the empty case and smoothed out the duvet where it had been laying, leaving no trace that she had ever been there. 
Her heart already racing, it almost exploded right out of her chest as she slipped back out of the door to Patton's cabin, only to see him walking down the narrow corridor directly towards his room, towards her. Uh, Dr. Wrights, Gerald greeted with a stage smile, though the suspicion on his face was so unmistakable that it could have probably shown up clearly on camera. Something I can help you with? Patton. Agatha gave a polite nod back to the researcher, lifting the case behind her back. The one upside of the tight corridor was that Patton was so close to her, he couldn't see what she was hiding. The obvious downside being he might be close enough to clock Dr. Wright's suspicion of him. Did you need something? Patton chuckled. Sorry, it's just, what were you doing in my quarters? Her heart was still racing, desperately trying to form a plausible excuse somewhere in her mind. Agatha's free hand reached into her pocket, something brushing against her fingertips would have to do. Uh, you dropped this, she exclaimed, pulling out a $20 bill and handing it to Gerald, a small price to pay to keep her subterfuge. Earlier on in the mall near SCP-715, I saw it fall out of your pocket. I had other matters to attend to down at... A anyway, I wanted to make sure you got it back. Oh, thank you, Gerald blinked in surprise, taking the money. As she squeezed past him and walked out of the living quarters, Agatha could barely stop her hands from shaking. Although those tremors of nerves would have to become the trembling of absolute horror when she saw the footage that the optical enhancement device collected. Patton was one of the creatures from the pit. It didn't seem possible. He didn't even have clearance to know about the pit, and any of the clones or SCP-715-As that managed to claw their way up to the surface were immediately terminated by on-site security. The instances becoming known as SCP-715-Bs if they made it that far. Yet somehow Patton, or whatever he really was, had made it through undetected, but that was far from the worst discovery Dr. Wrights would make. She used a number of the same anomalous optical enhancement devices to observe the SCP-715-A creatures within the pit, only to find that she and the other researchers had made a grave mistake. The SCP-715-As, they were all humans. What the Foundation had initially thought were the distorted, imperfect clone copies of everyone who had used the SCP-715 photo booth were actually the originals. They had been trying to climb back up because they wanted to come home. Their places taken by SCP-715-Bs. But none of those people, now twisted, disfigured, and unrecognizable, were able to explain to the Foundation who they were, and they'd been shot left to fall back into the pit and die. Acting fast, Dr. Wrights updated the classification of SCP-715 to Keter, although this was later rescinded back to safe. The creature that looked like researcher Patton was apprehended and brought in for interrogation. After learning the truth behind SCP-715, the photo booth was secured and locked up permanently. But as of now, the project investigating SCP-715 has been put on hold. No one at the Foundation wants to admit their mistake that they now have an extra-dimensional pit full of innocent, distorted people, or that they have no idea where all their body-swapped counterparts are. Now go and check out SCP-1733 Season Opener for another tale of another anomaly caught on film. This time, it's a basketball game that you won't be able to stop watching. Or if you'd rather further your investigation into some more paranormal photography, then we've got just the video for you. SCP-978, The Desire Camera.